I am Sarah, a graduate engineer specializing in dams and reservoirs. My title is Reservoir Abandonment or Discontinuation and how we should adapt a sustainable approach. So firstly, I am going to start with an introduction to reservoirs, followed by a brief discussion of the Todd Brook Reservoir. I will then cover the law surrounding reservoirs. Um, I will then define discontinuation and abandonment. And then there will be some discussion of the main aspects under the three pillars of sustainability before drawing some conclusions. The majority of reservoirs in Northern Ireland were constructed over 100 years ago. These reservoirs were built for a variety of purposes, including flood control, water supply, industrial purposes, or to provide an area for recreation. Reservoirs are barriers which are built across a river, causing it to store raw water above the natural ground level. This image here shows us the main elements of a typical reservoir. There are five main types of reservoirs, an arch dam, a buttress dam, and then the three most common, which we would see in Northern Ireland, are earth embankments, gravity dams, or rock fill dams. These dams have potential to fail, causing a risk to life for those downstream. The six main failure modes are dam breach, foundation failure, instability, structural failure, uncontrolled seepage, or overtopping. In 2019, the spillway erosion at the Toddbrook Reservoir surrounded great media attention and brought dam safety to the forefront. The earth embankment contains 300 million gallons of water. Heavy rainfall in the area caused the reservoir level, le water level to rise and water to flow over the auxiliary spillway, which you can see in the bottom image. The spillway then began to fail and become eroded. The main concern here would be that the spillway failure would have allowed water to seep through to the embankment and compromise the dam core. If this were to happen, it's highly likely that there would have been a dam breach situation. This would have been highly detrimental to the 6,500 residents and their homes immediately downstream. Thankfully, the rapid response prevented dam breach and there was no loss of life in this circumstance. To date, there have been no fatalities associated with dam failures in Northern Ireland. Sadly, the same cannot be said for England, Scotland and Wales. Due to the nature of reservoirs associated, due to the nature of risk, sorry, associated with reservoirs, their level of required maintenance and supervision tends to be stipulated within the law. Across Great Britain, there has been legislation in place to ensure reservoir safety since 1930. In England, the Reservoirs Act 1975 is the law which currently applies to any reservoir with a storage capacity of greater than 25,000 cubic metres. It places a legal responsibility upon the reservoir manager to ensure the reservoir meets the recommended safety standards. Discussion is currently ongoing as to whether this threshold will be lowered to 10,000 cubic metres. Legislation in Scotland and Wales is very similar to the Reservoirs Act of 1975, but with a threshold capacity of 10,000 cubic metres. Here in Northern Ireland, there is no formal, formal legislation on reservoir safety yet in place. The Reservoirs Act 1975 has generally been accepted as good practice by the majority of reservoir owners. However, forthcoming legislation in the form of the Reservoirs Act Northern Ireland 2015. Um, when, the reservoir, when this legislation is, becomes fully enacted, all reservoirs in Northern Ireland with a capacity of greater than 10,000 cubic metres will be subject to a series of stringent inspections. In response to the forthcoming legislation, some small reservoir owners are considering discontinuation or abandonment of their reservoir in order to bring the capacity beyond its ambit. But what does discontinuance and abandonment actually mean? Well, this is how the terms are defined within the forthcoming legislation. Discontinuance, making the reservoir incapable of holding 10,000 cubic metres of water above the natural level of part of the surrounding land i.e. reducing its capacity. And abandonment, making the reservoir incapable of filling with water above the natural level of any part of the surrounding land. So this means removing the reservoir fully and returning it to its natural river flow. It is vital that we adopt a sustainable approach when determining the future of any reservoir. Financial implications are often the greatest driver for the discontinuance or abandonment. 
Reservoirs Act, Northern Ireland 2015, enforces a legal responsibility to ensure reservoirs are regularly supervised and maintained. Reservoir owners will now be required under law to undertake Section 10 inspections. These are carried out once every 10 years by an all reservoirs panel engineer and Section 12 statements, annual inspections carried out by their supervising engineer. These inspections highlight any defects, and once a defect has been reported, the reservoir manager has a legal responsibility to ensure recommendations are undertaken inside the specified time frame. Common defects requiring works include culvert collapses in the embankment, defects within the embankment such as seepage or settlement, insufficient drawdown capacity or insufficient spillway capacity. All these factors attribute to high financial implications for the reservoir owner. Reservoirs typically generate little or no income themselves and many do not generate enough finances to fund the repair. If the dam is failing, removal can become the most cost effective option. The cost of repairing a small reservoir can be up to three times the cost of its removal. Sometimes smaller, private, smaller scale private owners may not have the financial capacity to complete the abandonment or discontinuation while it's restoring the landscape to a high standard. Also, a lower res a discontinued reservoir would now lie outside of the Reservoir Act 2015. The owner, owner would still be liable in tort, and the reservoir would still require a degree of maintenance. The provision of a grant for small scale reservoir owners would improve standards of output and encourage prompt action. Financial support could be justified as often objectives such as improving the recreational facilities, restoring river connectivity, or improving habitats are often to the benefit of the general public rather than for private financial gain. Monitoring of the site post abandonment is essential to ensuring environmentally secure. And ideally, this should be included in the works budget. By monitoring the site's post work, any negative implications for the immediate area and downstream would be identified promptly and may even allow for remediation prior to full impact. There is potential for abandonment and discontinuations to provide valuable research opportunities. For this to work effectively, a greater level of coordination is required between engineers and researchers to appreciate the true value of abandonment and discontinuation as field studies. Population expansion and increased urbanization following the Second World War resulted in increasing pressures on reservoir owners to provide open access to reservoirs. Since then, reservoirs have become a place where people tra travel to escape and enjoy nature. Many reservoirs feature a public right of way, often this is along the dam crest. We would expect to see adverse public reaction to the construction of a new dam. The same is also true for the discontinuance of an existing dam. Discontinuation may temporarily decrease its visual appeal, particularly along any shallow shorelines where the reservoir bed may become exposed. Reservoir abandonment has the potential to completely remove the site as an amenity. Ultimately, this will be dependent on the quality of the work and its visual appeal and accessibility post work. With time, nature will tend to soften any disturbance um, caused by such engineering work, but consideration must be taken over how the site will be left for future generations. And finally, social. Discontinuance or abandonment in Northern Ireland will require approval from both planning and environmental authorities. As is often the case with controversial projects, this becomes the main opportunity um, for public representation in the form of the planning application. Opposition to a reservoir's discontinuance can, become, can come from a range of sources, and it is unlikely that they would have much regard for the own, owner's economic motives. Thorough community engagement is essential and must be undertaken at an early stage in the project, providing all relevant stakeholders with an opportunity to voice their points of view and understand that of others. Careful consideration must also be given towards ensuring the site is safe, particularly if public access is to be permitted. Site configuration should limit risks in relation to steep slope, deep water and soft sediment. One of the main concerns with reservoir abandonment is that many developers have taken advantage of the reservoir's flood attenuation benefits with the construction of riverside properties downstream. 
Reducing reservoir capacity has also reduces its ability to attenuate flood flows, hence increasing the risk of downstream flooding. Any discontinuation or abandonment will require very careful planning and consultation, all of which demand a lengthy and costly process. It's your 10 minute warning just. Reservoir constructions alter the natural functioning of the ecosystem by disrupting flow patterns, changing water temperatures and chemistry, alteration of fish migration patterns and changes to sediment transport. Consequently, any alternative any alterations to a reservoir will also impact on the ecosystem. In some cases, ecological reasons may be the driver for dam removal or discontinuance. For example, in America, dam removal is supported where its construction has inhibited the migration of fish. Due to their nature, reservoirs are often situated within environmental designations. These areas have been legally safeguarded to prevent the loss of habitats or species and maintain biodiversity. The image shown here was a reservoir which was lowered to allow work to a valve but you can clearly see the salt build up to the reservoir bed. The quantity of build up depends on the catchment geology, the age of the reservoir and its volume, and the inflowing river velocity. Salt and sediments can become mobilized and transported downstream altering downstream channels. Abandonment can result in tempor temporarily increased sediment load, which may cause suffocation to ver various flora or fauna. Discontinuance provides an advantage here by retaining a small lake, which effectively acts as a silt trap, preventing some of the accumulated sediment being washed downstream. In conclusion, thorough research, oops, sorry, uh, thorough research on the reservoir's history may enable identification of the potential sources of sediment pollution. Any abandonment or discontinuation should be carefully considered in the context of its catchment to establish any potential consequences. Plans must be in place to deal with the salt in the basement, ensure that it remains stable, is not transported downstream, encourages revegetation, yet the area remains safe for public access. An environmental impact assessment should be carried out alongside the proposed reservoir scheme in order to identify and mitigate any potential impact which the project may have. An EIA is likely to enhance the stakeholders' views by assuring them of a sustainable approach. And it's highly probable that as the reservoir is lowered, the bed which is exposed will become a small wetland. Wetlands encourage biodiversity and enhance environment enhance the environment through water purification, reducing flooding and climate regulation. Discontinuance again holds the advantage over abandonment in this case, in that existing ecosystems are retained, albeit reduced, whilst introducing a new area of wetland, which sets to increase the biodiversity. And finally, when the Reservoirs Act 2016 becomes fully enacted, there will be a legal responsibility upon reservoir managers within the capacity threshold to ensure that their asset meets the necessary safety standards. Introduction of the 10,000 cubic meter threshold has encouraged some reservoir owners to consider options such as removal of the dam, um, removal of the dam from the ambit of the law by abandonment or discontinuation. The future of any reservoir must be decided within the confines of sustainability. One. Financial implications are often the greatest driver. However, to complete this in a sustainable manner also requires substantial financial output, which many private reservoir owners simply cannot afford. The provision of a grant has potential to ensure that a sustainable option has been adopted. Two, as with any project, it is vitally important that stakeholder engagement is carried out as early as possible. Seeking the viewpoints of all stakeholders is essential to ensuring that the resulting site meets the needs of all appropriate parties. And thirdly, an EIA should be carried out alongside any decisions surrounding reservoir's future. Not only will this enhance the perception of the stakeholders, but will also encourage an environmentally sustainable approach through all aspects of the project. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me today and look forward to your questions from the panel. Very good, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, that's a really, really good presentation. So I'm going to start with Warren, if you want to start the ball rolling with questions. Okay. Um, Cheryl, thank you very much. Um, I, 
I actually met up with Orla and Robert earlier to look at questions we could ask you, and um, I think you've covered most of them. So I can imagine the other two are sitting floundering, thinking of what they're going to ask you now. Um, but I was going to ask you about flood risk management, um, because as you say, there's a certain amount of balancing and attenuation that we get from reservoirs at the moment. Um, and it probably almost ties back into the funding mechanism is, you know, would you see this as a, as a mechanism to potentially get funding for the reservoir owners um, to, to continue providing that flood mitigation? Or do you think it's something that perhaps when we look at flood, flooding downstream reservoirs, we should just discount the, the balancing effect of the reservoirs? Um, I think you should um, incorporate both aspects. So I think um, obviously it's a very important aspect of the reservoir is the flood attenuation. Um, it's a flood, flood attenuation capacity. Um, so it's obviously very important for those downstream. Um, it was probably part of the warrant that would um, it would warrant the grant. Um, so yeah, alongside obviously the other um, reasons such as encouraging um, the use of the area as a recreational facility. No. Sarah, thank you very much. No, that's, that's great, thank you. Uh, Orla, you're up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. Um, Find it very interesting. Um, and I suppose my question maybe leads on a bit um, from Warren's, where you you mentioned um, there's obviously been discussion on the provision of a grant. And given generally the, the economic situation that uh, reservoir owners may be in and the social and environmental benefits that there are from reservoirs, what is your view? on the provision of grants and what benefits do you think this would bring? Um, so first of all, I, I think I mentioned in my presentation that the majority of benefits that we get from some of these small scale reservoirs are not to the benefit, um, firstly and foremost of, of the reservoir owner. It's more of the local community, such as the recreational facilities or um, providing flood attenuation or um, encouraging the wildlife aspect. Um, so I think it could be justified in that the reservoir owners themselves are not directly benefit, benefiting from the, from either discontinuation or abandonment. Thank you very much. And Robert. Uh, hi, Sarah, uh, that was a great presentation, uh, so well done. So my question for you is, uh, what measures should be put in place to ensure public health and safety when considering a reservoir for discontinuance? Um, so health and safety in terms of the site following the work? Well, you, you'd mentioned uh, during discontinuance there could be quite a lot of silt uh, left yeah. uh, and a high level of silt. So is there certain health and safety measures that you should be considering? Yes. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the silt, um, I think it would be very important um, to um, liaise with environmental specialists, first of all, um, and, and how we deal with that silt. Um, so whether we can adapt the area and, you know, keep, have certain areas of the site that is not public access to allow it to grow over a period of time or whether we can fully remove the silt from the area um, and deal with it another way um, and dispose of it properly. So, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, so, Matthew, if you want to, uh, Sarah, you want to unshare your screen and then Matthew, you start sharing your screen. I'll go through that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. next up we have Matthew Buchanan. Uh, Matthew works as a project scientist and hydrologist within RPS, Flood Risk and Water Environment Team. 
Uh, Matt's focus is uh, primarily on statistical and flood hydrology and its application across a range of projects in the water industry, including water quality and traditional flood risk uh, projects. So Matt, you joined RPS as a graduate after graduating from Queen's University in 2018. Uh, Matthew's presentation tonight will be on developing a hydraulic hydrological assessment toolkit for NFM techniques, a case study of the Upper Garnock in Scotland. Um, so, Matthew, if you, want yeah, to, okay. if you want to share your screen fully there, um, your sort of, um, your notes are sitting there, if you, your display settings. Is that better? And now we go to your from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. That's okay. Just uh... so I'm not sure. Don't worry, we won't be taking this into time time off. <laughs> um, no, that's okay. And then just say for beginning. But we will be disappointed if you don't start off by saying thanks, Daniel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In a very enthusiastic sort of way. Um, sorry. No, no, you're okay. It's okay. Take your time. It's all right. Just uh, when you as, a, as an open question, do I need to share the um, PowerPoint or the screen? Uh, no, <laughs> prob probably best to share the screen. Share screen. Yeah, and then when you change, you just change your your um, just share your screen. There, we'll talk you through. <laughs> um, it's just that you had your notes all on it, so we just switch your. So click from beginning. Um. Yeah. And then your display settings in the over to your top left. And then swap presenters you, and that's you. All right. So go. you're happy enough? I think so. That's all sorted now, yeah. Um, that's good. That no, no, that. you're you're quite all right. Don't worry. Technological right. ignorance. Um, yeah. No, no, it's, you're all right. Anyway, take a couple of seconds and we'll, uh, then we can go at your own pace. All right? Yeah, that's grand. Um, yeah, so not disappoint. So thanks a lot for that, Daniel. Um, might be a bit of a, a giveaway that that was the first line. Um, so yeah, as, as Dan had mentioned there, um, my presentation is, is going to talk you through some of the work I've been involved in in the emerging ways of um, hydrological analysis and the assessment of NFM um, techniques at a catchment scale, with a particular focus on the Upper Garnock um, catchment in Scotland. Um, so. Right from the outset, especially given the wide and varied audience of, of the of the SIWEM calls, um, with maybe some people not directly involved in, in flood risk and hydrological assessments, uh, I think it's important to discuss really what do we mean by NFM and natural flood management. So in its simplest form, natural flood management and NFM is the use and implementation of um, natural processes and materials um, to help reduce flood risk. Um, and in some cases, coastal um, flood risk and erosion. Um, and it's really in this natural way that NFN can be thought of as a, as a soft engineering approach that can really supplement our traditional hard engineering options, um, the traditional options that we have. So if we look at the, at the slide here um, on the left, we have four main categories, which is your land and soil management. Uh, for example, land drains here, um, your in-stream structures, which would be your leaky dams, and then you've got upper catchment management, which would be different types of woodland, for example, catchment and cross slope woodlands. And then you've got your storage measures, um, for example, um, offline storage ponds. Um, so moving forward to the project um, itself, uh, the area of the upper Garnet was identified as one of the many potentially vulnerable areas under CEPA's flood risk management strategies. But one of these, one of these many identified PBAs. And really looking at the, the map on, on the right here, um, one of the, the main areas of interest um, of potential flood risk are identified as Kilburnie um, at the confluence of the main Garnock River here with the Dimple, Padoff, um, Pondevin Burns. Glen Garnock, just downstream of this, um, 
of this major confluence and then long bar um, which is heavily influenced by the by the power grey burden here um, in the southeast of the study area um, and to provide a bit of context uh, about the fluvial flood risk um, and the impact of fluvial flood risk in, uh, um, in, the, in the area um, we can see here that there's 790,000 um, pounds worth of average annual damages um, due to, to flooding in the area with around 90 percent of this so around um, 711,000 um, pounds worth um, a year attributed to fluvial flooding. Um, with the, the photo just providing a bit of context, is uh, one of the most one of the more extreme events that's occurred across the Garnet Valley. So really, it's on, it's on this backdrop um, that uh, hydrological analysis sort of framework or toolkit, whatever you'd like to call it, was needed and developed um, to assess the benefit and subsequent effectiveness of of proposed NFM techniques um, to alleviate flood risk in the Upper Garnet, uh, working alongside the already existing flood protection scheme um, in the area. And so this brings us on to, to the staged approach that, that, we took, that we took to it. So stage one of the hydrological analysis, as you can see here, was a, a knowledge-based statistical desktop assessment, a bit of a mouthful that, um, but uh, this was conducted and steered by the current NFM best practice guidance um, and recent NFM studies. So really of note here, um, you're talking about um, two key studies that were applied and adapted as being the Palm Brent study um, in Wales and the Colburn study um, that was conducted in England, which are two of the most well-known and well-studied areas. Um, and as is shown here, the, the main aim of the step in the hydrological analysis was to assess and implement a set of generalized reduction values um, to the non-storage based NFM measures. And in this instance, what we're talking about is, is the differing um, types of coppice, or it's, apologies, the different type of forestry. Um, so you have your agro coppice overland and riparian um, forestry that, were, that are proposed um, in, the upper, in the upper catchment. Um, and the, this was conducted really in, a, in an option style appraisal um, method whereby a range of percentage reductions were assessed and tested. Um, and as well, it's important to note that um, just as well as the literature review, we had tested a, a potential evapotranspiration rate per subcatchment, uh, which is based on a graded national data set of PET, but um, and a, sort of like an inverse distance weighting area weighted calc done to reduce this down to the subcatchment level. But um, Due to um, differences in the in the scale of the data sets, and also um, the fact that PET is um, is only provided up to 2014, this this was discounted in the end. And so, option two, as as the slide shows here, was um, the most appropriate option that was developed. And so, this was the five percent reduction applied to agro and coppice, which was based on the the Palm Brent study primarily. And the 20% and 15% to overland and riparian forestry, which was adapted slightly from the, the from the findings of the Colburn study. And the, these were chosen as it was found to draw together the best transferable evidence base um, within the literature that was applicable to reducing flood blows um, in the upper garnet itself. So moving on then um, to step two. Uh, step two of the hydrological analysis focused on. Um, the storage-based NFM measures. So we've talked about the non-storage-based. So this talk, this is about the storage-based NFM measures as shown here, for example, ponds and bog bombs and leaky dams, things of those nature. So similarly, again, um, the analysis was conducted in an options appraisal style way um, where a number of different representations of each measure um, were assessed and then a professional judgment call um, was made on the most appropriate representation um, of the upper garnet itself. Um, so the rationale behind this is explained in the table, which I'll, um, I'll spare you me reading verbatim uh, to you, but um, just to pick up on a, a, a number of key, key things and complexities within it. Um, of particular note, one of the harder measures to uh, implement at this sort of um, feasibility stage of a project and across really any uh, flood project um, is bog bonds. Um, and as the figure shows here, um, the storage, this, uh, as the figure shows, the storage volume calculated um, behind the bog bun um, was calculated through the half AB calculation, the traditional right angle of a triangle. Um, but it's important to note that 
this makes a number of assumptions that would need refined going forward in the detailed analysis. And the main assumption being that the implementation of a bulk bond would generally lead to re-wetting of the area behind it, um, the peatlands behind the bonds. And so secondary storage would then accrue and a further saving in terms of flood volume, peak flow and flood risk to the receptors downstream would occur as this cyclical effect continues over time. And similarly, when trying to hydrologically represent ponds, um, it was assumed that the ponds would not be empty and would have a certain amount of sort of stagnant water within them. And so while the assumption was made that, that there'd be full utilization at the Q2, at the QMATE event, um, it was decided that the storage capacity available should be capped at around 90% to account for this protected stagnant water within the storage ponds or trying to account for sort of antecedent conditions really um, within, within the calculations. And step three then, so on top of the hydrological analysis methods that were employed, um, a restricted and smaller scale hydraulic model was built. And when I say restricted and smaller scale, this is purely due to time constraints of the project, especially at this like stage one feasibility stage of, of any project. And so the hydraulic model was targeted um, in terms of the NFM measures. So generalized woodland, leaky dams and storage ponds. And it was targeted three key areas of the catchment that the five meter LIDAR um, covered. Um, so this was including the long, the long bar area, um, just so in, the, in the southeast. And so the main point of uh, the hydraulic model was really as a means of testing um, and validation of the hydrological analysis that was undertaken and to ensure reliability and validity of the methods and results um, that, that, that we had employed and found. So really the main question is, uh, does it or does it have the potential to work? Does the analysis framework provide sufficient and accurate representations of how it would appear on the ground? And does the analysis show a benefit and effectiveness in terms of the actual implementation of NFM in the upper garner to reduce flood flows? So to help us answer that question, this is quite a, a heavy slide, so I'll, I'll try and break it down. Um, the figure above shows the summary of the of the potential um, of the potential NFM effectiveness in terms of attenuating and reducing flood flows in the area across a range of return periods from the Q2 to the Q200 and, and also in the Q200 plus climate change. So really, there are a few key take home results from this. Um, number one is the implementation of the proposed NFM measures lead to a reduction in peak flows by as much as 21% at the QMATE or the Q2. So this is particularly important around certain flood sensitive areas within the upper Garnet study. Again, for example, this confluence um, at Kilburnie and also at the Pyre Reburn um, seen at Longbar. Um, the hydrological analysis also shows an effect of diminishing returns in terms of the NFM effectiveness to attenuating and reducing flood flows which is important and, and this is expected and it, it's really due to the finite storage capacity of certain measures and then the increased flood flow capacity um, that you see in a hydrograph of a more extreme event. But then it's also important that while we see this slight reduction in benefit, there's still an overall net effective effectiveness in reducing peak flood flows um, by as much as 8% by the Q200. So from 21% of the Q2, there's still a net effectiveness by the Q200 of 8%. And then finally, in the analysis, um, it also suggests a trend that the less steep catchments of the study area, for example, um, in and around Kilburnie, there is a significantly more potential to reduce peak flood flows with NFM measures. And really, that can be attributed to the fact that the natural fact that the less steep catchments can provide more potential to create larger storage features rather than the uh, steeper sloped, um, more rocky, bare faced um, upper catchment. And so hydrological hydraulic validation um, is accepted and, and important to note that the hydraulic model is simplified and restricted in, it, in terms of its complexity of the 2D build, as I've mentioned before. Uh, for example, the representation of the storage ponds um, and the end stream structures like leaky dams. But despite this simplistic nature of it and the noted drawbacks, the hydraulic model still shows a general good level of agreement uh, with the trends and analysis of the hydrological assessment across the three comparable areas. And as such, based on the results, um, the 2D model has served its purpose in validating and allowing a degree of certainty to exist within the hydrological analysis framework and assessment undertaken. And so 
As I begin to wrap up, another question that emerges from the study is the importance of NFM moving forward in the water industry and the ability to effectively analyze the potential impacts of NFM in an accurate and cost-effective and timely manner, uh, ever more important in, in, in a consultancy setting. Um, so really this practical analysis framework or toolkit uh, facilitates a robust level of analysis that is really commensurate to the typical effectiveness and benefit that NFM schemes may be able to achieve. So it's, it really represents the best chance of proving the effectiveness of these measures such that they can be brought forward to full detailed analysis and design as part of an integral, um, sustainable and adaptable um, flood risk management solution. And so I think a nice way to tie this all back um, to the SIOM Northern Ireland's uh, theme of the year, water and environment adapting to change. Um, so you see the range of, of interventions that are, that are possible in, in, in any schemes. So traditional flood risk engineering approaches are adapting and changing within the industry. And this study illustrates perfectly the most practical manner to test the feasibility of NFM measures to be used in order to supplement the conventional hard engineering flood schemes um, that are traditionally in place. And it's in this sense the project supports the changing idea within both the technical community and in the legislative documents that there's an increased understanding that NFM can complement these traditional hard engineering solutions and that hard and soft engineering should no longer be considered mutually exclusive. But really what the study highlights or tries to highlight is the NFM is a good tool to work with the environment in a natural and sustainable way, um, especially at the lower, more frequent term periods and in conjunction with hard engineering approach for the more extreme events. And hopefully really what the study highlights is that there's a change and a natural movement to more integrated approach to flood risk management to produce more holistic, sustainable flood risk management strategies for areas considered at risk. Um, and so really with that, I'd just like to um, thank you for my time and um, welcome any questions from the, from the judges. Thanks. That's really, really good, Matthew. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose, our three judges, we see Orla, do you want to go first this time? Yeah, um, thank you very much. And thank you for another very good presentation. Um, I do obviously have an interest in natural flood management myself, working in the area that I do. So I suppose one of the questions um, I'd like to put and ask you is sort of what monitoring sort of management and maintaining of natural flood management is there to ensure that their effectiveness is not slowly eroded away given the lifespan generally of flood risk structures and flood risk mitigation schemes? Um, do, do you take it, are you, are you getting a post-implementation? Like yeah, what, so... What so um, if we're using um, flood risk and uh, natural flood risk management with uh, local landowners, how do we ensure that um, the options that we're putting forward uh, are maintained in the long term over our 25, 50 year, whatever the design lives of our schemes are? Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's a hard question, really. Um, I suppose a number of ways in, in terms of landowners, and I'm thinking particularly in upper catchment management, you, you're really dealing with um, the likes of farmers and things that got there. So a, a way of a way of incentivizing um, those landowners to potentially do the the um, some of the baseline monitoring um, itself um, would uh, try and help on on, on that, um, but. Um, it's all well and good saying and incentivize it, but where the money comes from, um, I, again, that's a good answer that's come out of my mouth, but I'm not sure where the money for that, uh, where the money for that may come. Um, yeah, so. Thank you. No, that was uh, just uh, thank you for your thought on it. Okay, Robert. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. That was a really good presentation again. Um, so my question is, uh, it seemed like there was a big reduction in peak flows, but what does that actually mean in terms of uh, flood reduction of flood risk in the, the downstream villages and, and towns? And, and is, is there a potential to reduce the, the, the more traditional uh, hard engineering flood defenses uh, in that case? Um, so the, 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 reduction in, the reduction in peak flows that we're seeing are, are, really, um, are really indicative of, of a reduction in, in the flood risk that can be seen in, in, to the downstream receptors. Um, but the, 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 
to pick up on your second point, there there shouldn't, you know, be soft and hard engineering um, that, that shouldn't be thought of. Definitely not a, as as mutually exclusive. I think I think we do need to work together. So soft soft engineering these NFM measures. Um, the you know we need we need we need hydrological monitoring to be able to answer that with any sort of with any sort of degree of certainty. Um, it's okay doing a desk based study, but really as part of of, as part of any NFM study going forward, hydrological monitoring should be one of the key things in order to quantify the reduction to of flood risk to downstream receptors. Um, but from from the study itself, it, in terms of hard versus soft, so the soft engineering of NFM could have a, a real degree of impact at the Q2, the, the Q meet events, and the more frequent events um, in terms of, of swallowing, swallowing up the flood waters, but certainly should not be thought of as, um, as, as, as exclusive to the hard engineering fence, um, the hard engineering defenses, sorry, which are definitely needed to, um, to protect against the high standards, for example, the, the, the Q200s and, and, and those more extreme events um, that, that occur. Good. Yes, very good. And Warren, finally, over to you. That's okay, Matt. You were you were keeping talking there. I was starting to think you were going to answer my question before I got to you. <laughs> um, NFM. I would have always traditionally sort of looked at those sort of softer solutions like reforestation as a as a very long term solution, flood risk management. And a lot of it, you know, it is uh, we're resolving the problem for the here and now. Um, I suppose the thing is, and, and things like leaky dams again. From an engineering perspective, it's very hard to hang your hat on that and say that's going to give that amount of attenuation because I have no idea how much is going to leak through. <laughs> um, but I suppose my question is really: um, Do you see, you know, and, and you've said they they do both work together? Um, do you see the NFM as something that you will implement so that when we come to replace those defences in fifty years' time? we'll actually have some of that mitigation in place already and we'll, we can take that into the design at that stage. Or do you see it almost as a, an element where you're almost providing that climate change adaption to an existing scheme? Yeah, so... I'm sure if there's a question there or not, but... Yeah, <laughs> I'll try and answer something. So if I take it off topic, you can stop me. But um, so, yeah, that... that that's uh, yeah that's an interesting one I think that in terms of, of the, the replacing of the defenses I think that the, the NFM and, and like you say it's hard it's hard to quantify and similar to Senator Robert really to put any quantification on it there needs to be in every one of these studies detailed hyd hydrological monitoring post implementation and at that stage we may have something where you can say oh we have now implemented NFM for X number of years. The data suggests X reduction at the downstream end in terms of flood risk. So we may be able to reduce the, the cost and um, potentially reduce um, the design standard of, of the hard engineering um, defense schemes when they're being rehabilitated or, or, or going forward to, to, to new defense schemes. But um, at the minute um, where things stand, uh, as you were saying in, in the literature base um, uh, and in, in the study itself, um, they should be considered as a way of potentially mitigating against um, the increasing um, amount of water seen due to climate change. But until that hydrolog that that's really the key thing I think I think that we're fine until that hydrological monitoring is put in place, until you can stand over pure numbers and science behind it. Um, they have to be considered as a small part of an overall flood risk scheme. Uh, and, and the hard engineering approach still needs to be designed to the original standard as, as always set. And, and this is just, um, in some cases, you know, NFM is not just to reduce flood risk, it's also to provide greater catchment benefits. Um, for example, increasing water quality um, uh, and and even the fact of, of maybe slowing the water um, coming down. Um, so uh, certainly it, 
as it currently stands, it's better to think of it as a, as a small part of a, of a wider flood risk um, scheme that includes a large portion of, of power defence. No, that's great, Matthew. Thank you very much. Okay. That's you, Matthew. You can breathe now for a couple Thanks, of minutes. If you, yeah. <laughs> you want to unshare your screen, and Sam, if you want to share your screen. Um, so next up, we have Sam Purton from ACOM. Uh, Sam is a graduate environmental consultant uh, and is a graduate member of SIWA. Um, Sam's work largely focuses on environmental impact assessment and environmental management for uh, major infrastructure projects throughout Northern Ireland. So Sam's presentation this evening will be on the investigation of the role of Northern Ireland's coastal wetland wetlands in a climate or a change in climate. So uh, Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, yes, so as Daniel mentioned there, I am, I am doing my presentation on not necessarily a project I've been working with um, ACOM on, but it's more just a general theme I, I'm interested in. So um, hope I've been able to hopefully adapt that to uh, the, the chosen theme, water environment adapting to change. Um, so the first picture there is of Island Hills, that's in Strangford Lock, and um, that's one of the places um, I'll be touching on later in the presentation. So uh, Northern Ireland has a, a range of coastal wetlands. Um, some people, or most of you are probably aware of them anyway, um, but if not, we'll, we'll go through it and uh, we'll, we'll see how they can play a role in uh, climate mitigation adaptation. So um, just before we begin, um, ACOM, anytime we start a meeting, we start with a health and wellbeing moment. And um, I think it's, it's well worth taking up a couple of seconds in this presentation on mental well-being. Uh, we're all pretty isolated at the minute um, behind screens. So just to check in on a friend, uh, keep them lines of communication open. Um, and hopefully it won't be too long until we're uh, doing this thing face to face again. So uh, yes, I'll crack on into the main chunk of the presentation now. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, there's an abundance of coastal wetland in Northern Ireland. Um, and they all have an ability to store carbon. Um, now this is dependent on how healthy they are um, and um, the hydrological conditions. There's actually met, there's many factors um, that influence how effective they are in doing that. Um, but this presentation will cover, um, so where are they at the minutes um, and how are they protected at the minutes um, and what sort of designations are, are in these locations and um, what eco services they can provide us. So, um, we're looking at cl climate resilience, and that comes in two parts, mainly as mitigation and adaptation. And um, so we'll touch on that, and then we'll look at uh, what threats exist to these areas. And um, so you probably can think of some already, like pollution, uh, uh, development, that sort of thing. And then we'll look at um, going forward, how they can be protected and enhanced. So uh, here is a map um, I pulled together. So that just gives you an overview of Northern Ireland and what areas we're looking at. So up at the northwest there, we have Loch Foyle. Um, when you come down on the east coast, you have obviously Strangford Loch, you have Murloc, uh, Carlingford Loch as well. Um, along the northwest, north coast, it's more kind of, you have a kind of different geology there with um, the, the Antrim Plateau and stuff. So generally, uh, well, along there, it's more intertidal rock um, habitat found. Um, whereas what we're really looking at is um, coastal salt marsh and mud flats. So um, yeah, so Strangford Lock, uh, Carlingford Lock, Lock Foil. We also have uh, sea lion lagoons. So that sort of habitat um, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, this afternoon. Um, some of the designations there, uh, you've, you've all came across them before. Um, the main one, probably most relevant to wetlands is the Ramsar site. So in the 1970s, uh, the Ramsar Convention um, is there's designations stemming from that. Um, so you have Strangford Lock, uh, Carlingford and Lock Foils, they're all Ramsar sites, more honing in towards uh, the protection and enhancement of wetlands. So furthermore, um, they've suffered a decline um, globally. Uh, so reading up on articles in literature, um, it, it's obvious during the Industrial Revolution, these areas got hit hard. Um, using up the land for agriculture to feed people or industrial areas, maybe maybe uh, harbour expansion and um, things like that. Uh, but 
nonetheless, they remain very good at uh, storing carbon. Um, and yes, as I mentioned, uh, the, the habitats normally consist of mudflats, salt marshes, and um, also other habitats we have in Northern Ireland are uh, kelp forests and shellfish beds. Um, so they, they're kind of, we're not going to touch on them uh, beyond the intertidal region. Um, it's probably another, it's a big topic anyway, so we'll not touch on that, but uh, they, they play the role as well um, in storing carbon. Um, they're protected for all the sites I mentioned there, so SACs, SBAs, Ramsar, they, they come under an umbrella of uh, marine protected areas. Um, so there's a series of these sites and they're all protected by DERA um, and regulated. So um, yes, uh, and of course you have other um, organizations such as the National Trust, uh, Ulster Wildlife, RSPB. So you, and they're act active on social media as well. So you probably see quite a lot at the likes of um, World Wetlands Day. It was um, at the start of February there. Um, and those organizations, organizations are bringing a lot of um, conservation efforts forward um, and activities to engage the public and increase awareness of that. So um, yeah, so that's the current status. And um, we'll look at the role of what these coastal play, uh, wetlands play. So I mentioned they, they can store carbon, but we'll look at how they can do that. Um, so that is looking at mitigation. Uh, so we're looking at how these greenhouse gases can be stemmed, uh, the release of them can be stored in um, natural uh, carbon sinks. Um, and prevent them from being released into the atmosphere. And then we'll also look at ab adaptation. So um, we'll be looking at maybe the effects of sea level rise, how, how they can play a role in protecting uh, developments that way and um, extreme weather events. So um, looking at mitigation, um, this diagram here by Howard et, et al. Et, um, uh, can provide a good summary of uh, climate mitigation. Um, so on the top diagram there on the left, uh, there are mangrove plants. We don't have them in Northern Ireland, uh, but if you look in the middle there, you can see sea grasses and that sort of species. Um, so they basically store carbon by photosynthesis. Um, the carbon is stored in the plant material. Um, it can be, it can be um, diffused out into the soil uh, and stored as soil organic carbon, or it can be um, or stored in the plant material itself. But essentially, the, the key thing is the tidal flow and the constant movement of sediment and um, layers up. So um, the carbon carbon is stored in this in this habitat, um, and the the, car, the the carbon intake is higher than the oxygen release. Um, at the bottom there, you can see um, when these sites become degraded, so the oxygen increases, and that, that's because uh, the decomposition um, of we if the beasties um, eating away at the vegetation um, releases uh, the CO2. So um, that is why it's so important to look after these sites. And you can also notice there, um, there's a, as there's a dip, also, also indicates uh, the vegetation plays a, an important role of holding the sediment together with the root systems. So without that, the sediment can be released and uh, uh, yeah, so that is how, a brief touch on climate mitigation and how the coastal wetlands can play a part there. Um, looking at adaptation, uh, we're improvement in water quality. So these, these areas can um, provide a, a natural filter. Um, so they, they've been touched, uh, NI water and um, there's schemes inland using fresh water systems for uh, wastewater management uh, using artificial uh, wetlands and um, so there's been projects there uh, and they're, they're a natural service so um, they, they can regulate water quality quality pretty well and um, they can also protect from flooding so they essentially act as uh, giant sponges um, that's not a very technical term but it's a really good way to explain how it works um, you, oh, they also protect from coastal erosion by dissipating and absorbing energy from waves uh, so the likes of Strangford Lock and sites like that, um, maybe not as relevant uh, for um, coastal erosion, but there, there, there will be areas, especially with the changing climate um, around the UK and such, where that could become useful. And finally, uh, fish and wildlife habitat. So um, these sites are, are unique. They are 
designated for the wintering birds visit um, and the unique habitat they have. Um, and it's very last we have as well. Um, so they provide a, a good habitat for both species and um, the likes of the Brent geese are very about to pack up for bags at Strangford Lock, but uh, there are our winter visitors and that sort of uh, both species are, have enough pressure anyway, never mind the changing climate. So to protect their habitat is pretty important for um, us and future generations. So just um, look at the threats um, to these sites. Um, so human dist disturbance and reclamation for development. Um, from what I've read, uh, the UK, it's it's not as big as an issue now. Um, now the industrial revolution is over, but it's it's very noticeable in developing countries. Um, so when the land's reclaimed, uh, the habitat's removed, um, and, and the function is removed. Ten minute warning, Sam. Thanks. Thanks, Louise. Um, but the the function of storing carbon is removed, so that is lost. Um, alteration of coastal processes as well. Um, particularly tidal flow, so they rely on tidal flow um, uh, to supplement the, the sediment movement. Um, so that could be an issue and structures, so any structures being put in will need to be assessed. Um, uh, but there's also been studies that suggest that tidal structures can uh, um, construct coastal wetlands um, by um, changing the flow. So um, it can work two ways and essentially it's a site specific um, each, each area will be different um, depending on the conditions. Um, finally, um, pollution. So well, whether that's industrial or maybe it's um, from transport, marine transport, oil spills, um, or diffuse pollution from um, upper freshwater catchments heading down to estuaries. Um, uh, there's issues there. So uh, that's a photo of an upwater pollution event um, and any wetland at the estuary um, will, will, will feel the effects of that. Um, so it's important for that to be managed. Um, on coastal wetland enhancement, um, so there's four main uh, findings I found um, on my study that um, I thought were important going forward. So the continued protection, um, continued regulation, so any um, planning applications or anything, any of these sites will have to be considered, um, whether that's EIA or HRA processes, um, and they'll need to be considered um, in any planning application. Um, so um, I think it's important that any of these sites will need, any protection is reviewed and make sure the needs of the sites are addressed in any um, uh, legislation or um, guidelines. Uh, engagement with landowners, so um, a lot of these sites are near agriculture um, they're managed by landowners, so engagement with them to make sure best practice is implemented, um, maybe using pesticides, herbicides, um, things like that. Uh, government initiatives, so there was a recently an environmental challenge fund released by DERA, um, and one of the topics they're trying to promote is blue carbon. Um, I should have mentioned that earlier, blue carbon is the buzzword really for um, marine carbon storage. So um, it'll be interesting to see what comes from that. And um, it's a sign that um, initiatives are being put in place. Uh, and finally, public knowledge. I think uh, it is people need to understand these sites are important. I, I'm sure a lot of people have been out walking around them the, the last year. So um, maybe just to understand how they can influence our world going forward, uh, it, it, it'll benefit that and um, make people see the value in them. Um, so yeah, just to wrap up, um, it's obvious that these sites play a key role in climate resilience, mitigation and adaptation. Um, threats exist, but so do opportunities. So um, the likes of uh, the Environment Challenge Fund released by DERA, um, things like that are good. Um, Ulster Wildlife have also started a citizen science NI Shore program. So um, it gets people thinking and being able to spot things um, from having no knowledge maybe on the subject beforehand um, and then yeah improve awareness of the coastal wetland value so that's I think for me that's the most important thing and uh, that is me thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Sam. That was very, very good. Um, who went last? Warren went last uh, last time. So Warren, you're up for us first. Okay. Um, Sam, even if your presentation does, doesn't go so well today, don't worry. You've still got a place. Terry will speak to you about the, the wildlife photographs. Um, <laughs> there's another competition you can enter. Um, or rather, Tom can enter. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose from an engineering perspective, I'm sort of looking at this and thinking one of the one of the big issues is to do coastal squeeze where sites yep. can't migrate inland. Yep. Yep. Um, in those situations, what can we do to maintain or to adapt these coastal habitats to climate change and sea level rise? Yeah, uh, that, that's a, a good point, uh, Warren, because I was actually looking at a case study at uh, Poe Harbour. They had um, sea defences and what they were able to do is move their sea defences back. Now, the only thing is they had space to do that. They didn't have human settlements right behind the sea defences. So I, if, if you're lucky enough to have space, I think there is scope to uh, allow space for the, the wetlands to migrate back landward. Um, where you have human settlement, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I was trying to find uh, studies or anything like that, but I, I, as yet, I haven't been able to find anything, to, any solutions to that, because um, obviously human development will take a priority there. Well, that, that's it. I think that's the thing. It's, you know, there, there will be situations where... There are, there are suitable options, and, and yeah. yeah, we should take them. Yeah. So, no, that's great. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think Orla's up next. Orla, yeah. 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 Hi, thank you. Thanks for your presentation again. I find it really interesting. And this was actually had a question that probably leads a bit on now from Warren's as well in, in relation to climate change and carbon and such. Is there any understanding sort of within the United Kingdom, the UK, as to how much of a carbon sink the coastal wetlands are in comparison to say some of our other carbon stores like woodlands or such? I haven't been able to find any studies UK Pacific, but globally a lot of uh, researchers have, have, have said they're more effective. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know the, I can't give you a tonnage in that, um, how much carbon, uh, um, is compared, but I, I think for the, the space that they take up, um, I think is far less and their effectiveness is higher. Um, I, I don't know what researcher I who stated that, but um, <laughs> I can find that out. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Robert, finally to yourself. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, really good presentation again, Sam. Well done. Um, so I was more interested in what the public can do to help uh, maintain and look after our local um, coastal wetlands. And you mentioned at the end there the, the Shore NI program, and I found that yeah. really interesting. That I think you said that uh, members of the public could do basically citizen science, science, yeah. science basically. So what yeah. sort of things would they be asked to look at? And, and how do you think that program could be effectively rolled out to get the, the, the most out of it? Yeah. Um, I I haven't, si I haven't signed up with Reserve 8, but I, I assume it's more, um, it's it's mapping coastal habitats to see, to note what is there. And it means if there's a log of what is there, you can tell maybe in a few years what's changing. Um, and if there's any existing surveys, you can you can compare that as a baseline. Um, so and I think it is good if, if they're trained to see simple things or just to say what what there is you know and um, it, it's it's quite a good tool and the amount of people at the minute visiting these areas and taking an interest as well um i, I would say you get a good a good demand to or not take on doing that so i think um yeah i i, I think there's a, a lot of potential there to, about the um take off yeah absolutely uh, thanks Sam. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Sam. That's you done now. And um, that was a really important point you made at the start about checking in with a friend, particularly now during these times. But hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel. I think yeah. Arlene is starting to lift some of the restrictions. So 
Over to you now, Alistair Kenny. Uh, last but certainly not least, we have Alistair from Atkins. Uh, Alistair is an assistant clean water modeler and began employment with Atkins in 2017 after graduating from uh, Newcastle University with a master's in hydrogeology and water management. So since joining Atkins, Alistair, through his role as, uh, as part of the asset planning and solutions team, has gained uh, experience in a wide range of projects such as model builds, network capacity uh, assessments and low pressure studies developing the skills in hydraulic modeling, field test planning and coordination and data analysis. Uh, Alistair's paper tonight uh, is titled The Impact of COVID-19 on the Water Sector. So Alistair, when you're ready, over to you. That's perfect. Uh, can you see, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, can you see my slides okay? Right. I can, yeah. It looks good. Perfect. You're good to go. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am going to introduce my uh, paper today on the, by a short presentation, uh, which is the impact of COVID-19 on the water sector. Um, so a brief introduction. Uh, obviously, over the course of the last year, um, the impact of COVID-19 has had an impact on everyone's lives uh, and has uh, had a significant impact on the water sector. Um, this uh, presentation will hopefully highlight just how important uh, a resource water is. So uh, the presentation is split up uh, into five different sections. Uh, we have the initial impacts that uh, COVID-19 has had on the water sector, the environmental impact that has been seen, the financial impact, water demand impact, and then future considerations uh, to, take, uh, to take forward. So the initial impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as mentioned there before, COVID-19 has impacted everyone uh, in some way, shape or form, uh, whether that be uh, the switching to working from home rather than being in the office, the way we travel uh, and get about the place, uh, the way we consider our health uh, and our hygiene. Um, water plays a critical role um, in slowing the spread of the disease. Uh, the World Health Organization advised that the most effective way of reducing the risk uh, of the spread of the disease is by regularly washing your hands with soap and water. Uh, this uh, vitally highlights uh, how important water is uh, in our daily lives now. So moving forward into the environmental impact. Uh, the environmental impact uh, that has been seen uh, in the water industry uh, has been there's been an increase in energy demands uh, with water companies seeing an increase uh, in more usage of water uh, the increase in energy demands has been driven up as well uh, to ensure that uh, assets um, are kept operationally working uh, and that networks are, are working as uh, efficiently as possible uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, have also been reduced uh, as we've seen in the news due to local and national lockdowns uh, we've seen a, a decrease in uh, carbon emissions from cars and transport. Uh, this has also been seen slightly in, in the water industry as well, uh, with a reduction in, in emissions. Uh, disposal of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, as, ev as a part of everyone's daily life now. Um, we have we use a mask for going to the shops and then near enough uh, any time we're out and about. Um, irresponsible disposal of PPE with regards to disposable gloves and masks. Um, has been seen in the water sector with these being found in water courses, rivers, uh, and even water treatment works, um, which has just highlighted another envir major environmental impact the water, com water companies are having to deal with. Uh, as seen there in the photo uh, there with uh, wet wipes, um, there's also been an increase in sewer blockages. Uh, this has been seen in most water companies throughout the UK uh, with an increase in uh, Demand or domestic usage and, and water usage. There's been an increase in the amount of people being at home uh, and potentially disposing of uh, wet wipes down the toilet or uh, grease and oil uh, down their sinks, uh, which has led to massive fatbergs and wet wipes blockages, which has uh, increased the uh, environmental responsibility of water companies to try and remove these to ensure that sewers uh, provide are working uh, to the best of their ability. Moving forward with a few more environmental impacts then as well. So in certain buildings due to uh, the major switch in, in working from home, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, buildings and offices and city centers have been left empty uh, over the last year and a bit. Um, this has led to issues perhaps with um, obviously water not being used in these buildings with discoloration being seen in water 
after being after when water turned on again in the offices again, Legionella that builds up in pipes from not being used uh, for long periods of time, and then perhaps sometimes uh, there's even uh, smell issues as well, uh, which which happen and what other water quality issues that happens because of this. As mentioned before, then uh, with the increase in uh, in usage of water, uh, it puts an increased stress on the the water network. Uh, which has led to potential increases in uh, leakage overall uh, in the water network. Uh, this is maybe especially seen in, in the winter months uh, when, when leaks and bursts are more likely to occur. And as mentioned above there, uh, with, with empty buildings uh, and no one, no one about, uh, it's sometimes been harder to spot these leaks uh, and identify what, where the major leaks are coming from. Uh, other things like leaky toilets and things like that in, 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 mis in unused buildings. Um, have also uh, led to an increase in, in leakage. Uh, as well, uh, with the increased amount of clean water that we use, uh, there's an increased amount of wastewater that then needs treated. Um, this, is, this is majorly down to uh, the increase in domestic usage, uh, which has led to you know, more wastewater needing, needing treated, which has byproducts such as uh, uh, greenhouse gases and sludge, which, which, which is a, an environmental impact that negatively uh, impacts the environment. So moving forward, fi financial impact um, has also been seen in the water sector. Um, as mentioned previously, uh, with an increase uh, in, in usage, there's also been an increase in energy demands. Um, this, is, this is also a financial cost that is a uh, Water, the water industries and water company um, have, has had to deal with these additional costs uh, to ensure uh, the smooth running of, of their networks, both wastewater and clean water. And this has led to an increase in energy demand and cost. Um, a, a major, another major one which has severely impacted the, the bank balances of, of water companies has been the decline in industrial uh, and commercial uh, users. With uh, the impact of local and uh, national lockdowns and factories and these industries and uh, not being able to, to operate at maximum capacity. Uh, the consumption patterns have changed and, and the majority of money that, that water companies would get would be from these, these industries, which has been a big loss of revenue. Um, with the increase in domestic usage, uh, householders, uh, customers, the, the influence of metering uh, has also been highlighted uh, with not all household users being metered. Uh, or build uh, for their for their usage of water, and um, this has led to the the speculation that in the future there may be an impact of this. Um, will there be tariff adjustments, or will there be an increase in uh, the amount uh, build uh, to householders for using water if there is an increase in in their usage over time? Um, at the at the start of the uh, the pandemic as well, uh, there was a, a quite a quite a big shortage in supply of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. This was also seen by uh, the water sector as well as a whole, um, trying to obtain this equipment for their their workers uh, to undertake essential and essential work uh, in their industry. Um, it, it was it was harder to obtain, and obviously increased costs led to this being a, a financial impact that was seen. Um, another impact then of, of, of COVID um, was um, the increased costs due to testing wastewater. Um, uh, studies have shown that uh, COVID-19 can be transported through water uh, by fecal matter that goes into the toilet and then hence goes into the wastewater network. Um, the increased costs of this um, have, have, have been down to more regular testing of the wastewater treatment works and more time intensive uh, with, with more people having to to, to do this uh, this work to, to test for COVID in the water. Um, another major uh, financial loss for, for the water industry has been delays to the major capital projects. Um, obviously with restrictions and everything in place, a lot of uh, construction work was put on hold for a, couple, a good couple of months and social distancing guidelines in place and the amount of people who could be on site, et cetera, et cetera, was, uh, was highlighted. And this uh, put a delay on, on uh, quite a few capital projects. Uh, with this as well, 
there was maybe a, a shift towards the, the emphasis on uh, operational and emergency work uh, on, on the water networks and clean and waste water that was prioritized over these major capital projects in the short term, uh, just to make sure that the, the network as it is could be uh, could work as, as best as it could um, under the current setting without these major projects in place. Um, another major uh, consideration that probably wasn't in anyone, any employer's mind was the impact of, of workers having to isolate um, due to maybe contracting the virus uh, or even uh, if they had to furlough uh, workers as well, which is another financial constraint. Uh, moving forward then as well, it's, it's a consideration, the financial impact that may be needed uh, from water companies is to consider if there is going to be a shift from people working from home or in the office, uh, the overhead costs uh, to keep these uh, offices open um, with uh, a, cut in, a cut in revenue um, uh, that has been seen because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, Louise. Um, so moving on, the water, water demand impact. This is probably one of the, the most uh, vital changes that we've seen over the course of the last year uh, and a half or so. Um, the large scale uh, consumption patterns, as mentioned before, have changed quite drastically um, with an increase in household and domestic usage due to more people being at home uh, and using more water throughout the day. Um, we've, we've seen a change in the peak times when people will be using water. Um, normally your peak times are normally seen early in the morning between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. And then in the evening uh, between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. When you're getting these large demand spikes, uh, now we're, we're potentially seeing uh, a more continuous usage throughout the day, uh, with an increase in people washing their hands, using household appliances such as dishwashers um, and washing machines. Um, this is also potentially highlighted uh, that you know there may be issues later on down the line with low pressure issues in the network, uh, with with houses maybe not not getting sufficient pressure due to these demand changes uh, that weren't obviously highlighted uh, in pre-COVID uh, demand patterns. Um, and as mentioned before, the, the major decline in industrial and commercial usage has significantly changed uh, the water demand patterns that we've seen. Uh, typically, these industrial and commercial users would uh, use large amounts of water for whatever industry or, or thing they are making, um, which, which would you know, alter what we see in the, in the network and how the network operates. Uh, and as, as, again, as mentioned before, the increased amount of wastewater that needs treated as well. Okay, so then to kind of conclude or get towards the end here, there's quite a few future considerations uh, that need to be taken into account um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic in the water sector. Um, kind of seen, could there be a shift in water demand? Uh, will water demand and patterns return to what they were pre-COVID or will they continue on, what, on the current pattern that they're showing now um, with more usage throughout the day? Um, there's also the influence of, of pressure on water resources um, with growing populations in, in many countries. Uh, there's the pressure on, on, on certain areas running out of water has been seen in the news in countries such as South Africa, Australia and Brazil, uh, the, the impacts of not just COVID-19, but aging infrastructure and the impact of climate as well uh, will put a severe pressure on resources. Um, so this has kind of highlighted the importance of upgrading the water infrastructure and then maybe identifying new sources of, uh, of water. Uh, new sources could be desalination plants, converting salt water to uh, clean drinking water, but this is a very expensive process. Water transfers have also been talked about uh, as, as, as transferring water from areas of surplus to areas of uh, deficit. Um, countries such as Singapore uh, have been using water transfers. Uh, they've been getting their water from Malaysia uh, that supply areas of deficit since 1927. So it's something to consider. Um, other considerations then as well, it's highlighted the importance of water. Sustainable Development Goal 6, uh, the sustainable management of water and sanitation for all um, has been highlighted and under, underserved areas must be expanded and improved to, to make sure that everyone has this critical resource um, going forward. Um, the 
up the impact of COVID-19 in the long term, it's, it's something that's going to have to be considered. Uh, it's going to be different, I suppose, throughout the world uh, with different restrictions in, in place and how prevalent the virus is in a country. Uh, it's going to impact how, uh, how the water industry and the water sector uh, continues into the future and copes with it. Um, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Um, look forward to any questions from the panel. That's great, Alistair. Thank you very much. Um, Warren, do you want to kick the kick the kick off the questions? Yeah, well, I'm going to jump in first because the others knew more about this than I did. <laughs> um, Alistair, thank you very much. No, it was a very interesting presentation, and I probably haven't mentioned that to everyone else when they've given their, their <laughs> talk. But thank you very much for all of you. Um, We've said there's a greater amount of domestic usage happening now um, because we're all working from home and because you can pop in and put the washing machine on in the middle of the afternoon. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the same peak in the morning in that sort of morning rush or, or the evening. So we would be fair to say there's a sort of a leveling off of the peak. Now, so it wouldn't be as high necessarily as high as it used to be. It's not as high as it used to be at those peak times that we'd see. And obviously with people maybe going back to working in offices and stuff, you may see a slight peak, but it's not going to be as great as what it was. And with yeah. more people being at home, you're going to see that maybe throughout the day. Okay. Well, yeah, so I, I was going to say that because you don't have that peak anymore, then are we actually reducing the pressure um, for water companies? Because they don't have to hit that high peak anymore. They can have a more sustained delivery of water and also sewage treatment during the day? It depends. Surely that's easier. It, it, it depends because if you're, I mean, obviously you have your peak demands in, at your morning and your evening times, the network would be set up to kind of provide at those peak times and maybe it wouldn't supply as much water throughout the day with people not being at home. Uh, with with that shift now, it's it's maybe, it's, it's harder to plan you know, to ensure that water is supplied to every customer and that there's no outages of water or any low pressure in people's areas um, to ensure that everyone does get water at the end of the day. So in a way, there still is a pressure there. If there is continued water use, usage needed throughout the day, it's still going to put pressure on the on the network and the aging infrastructure as well. Right. Okay, no, thank you. Good. Uh, Robert? Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, uh, Alistair. Uh, very well done. Uh, it's a very topical uh, presentation to close with. Uh, so my questions related to one of the nice photos you had at the start, uh, and that's uh, the um, uh, COVID-related PPE, such as hand wipes and um, disposable masks, um, yep. and they, they, would they would be um, blocking sewers, blocking pump stations overflowing combined sewer overflows uh, and ended up in beaches and rivers. What do you think could be done to reduce um, people flushing um, uh, COVID-related PPEs and other inappropriate materials into our sewers? Um, it's it's maybe a more a better public awareness um, of what why we shouldn't flush these down the toilet and stuff like that. With especially with wet wipes, there's a lot of the ones on the packaging now saying they can be flushed, but you know in essence they're actually they, they can't be flushed. There still is plastic in them which clogs up sewers and everything like that. So I'd say it's maybe more public awareness. Uh, you see stuff from water companies and on LinkedIn or on billboards and stuff saying you know do not flush this, only flush the three P's, pee, poo and water down the toilet. Um, so it's maybe just educating the public just about what not to do to, to ensure the infrastructure is there for many years to come to, to supply the public. Very good. Th thanks, Alistair. No problem. And finally, Orla. Hey, thank you. Um, again, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think question I have probably again maybe slightly similar as well to to that from Robert. Um, obviously, COVID and the situation we're in has um, highlighted a number of issues that water sector has been dealing with for a number of years around the sustainable use of water and around the disposal of inappropriate materials, um, and with then long term, I don't think we're going to be out of this COVID working situation anytime soon um, and it's going to affect our lives for the long term. Um, there is an important messaging on consumer responsibility 
So I suppose around that messaging, is there anything that you think water companies can be doing more in relation to messaging? And is that just uh, an issue for water companies or is there a wider issue for society and other agencies around the messaging of the environmental impacts and sustainable water use? It's a very, very good question. Um, the... It's not just solely down to the water companies, I would say. Um, it's it's down to the public and, and everyone to take responsibility for, you know, looking after the environment. Um, I, I suppose that you can see from, uh, you know, loads of plastic bottles and stuff ended up in beaches and water you've seen through Blue Planet and programs like that. And with, with water use, water companies are trying to not force the public, but reduce the amount of daily usage by, the public rather than using vast amounts and you know lots of leakage and wasting water uh, and, and trying to be more sustainable by promoting uh, sustainable practices like using water bots reusing water things like that so i think it's perhaps a mix of both both kind of need to take responsibility and um, but it, it, it's maybe a there is quite a lot of stuff out there from water companies trying to feed information out to the public and you know ensure how to keep their the network uh, and the infrastructure you know, running for many years to come so, and to be more sustainable, really. Thank you very much. No problem. Very good. That's you, Alistair. You can relax now for a few minutes. Um, so that concludes uh, all of our presentations. Um, our judges, I believe, are going to sneak off to a secret uh, Teams call and discuss the winner. Uh, and in the meantime, we have uh, Terry Fuller join us um, uh, to say a few words. Um, I'm sure you all know him, uh, but Terry Fuller is the Chief Executive of SIWEM, uh, representing the community of over 10,000 experts on flooding, climate, uh, coastal change, uh, water resources and management, the natural environment around the world. Uh, Terry has over 30 years experience in the business as a water and environmental manager and I am delighted to have him here with us tonight to support this event and uh, say a few words. So Terry, over to you. Thank you very much uh, Daniel. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, what an interesting time it's, it's been um, the last hour or so. Um, it's um, I've, as, as Daniel said, I've been in, in the sort of water and environment sector for over 30 years now and, and had and, and, and I am still enjoying a, a fantastic career in that sector. And nothing makes me happier than listening to uh, people like we have this evening who are, you know, also making that choice to get into the, to this sector. Um, you know, what wonderful opportunities um, await. I have no doubt about that. And uh, really great to see the, the quality of, of work that's being done. So congratulations to all of our, our speakers so far, um, regardless of the, the outcome next. I also just want to say a massive thanks as well to Northern Ireland branch. Um, you've always set the bar really high in my experience, certainly ever since I came into this, this role. Um, the uh, events that you put together and the way that you, you run the branch is uh, exemplary actually and uh, the relationship you enjoy as well with both our members um, and other uh, partners and supporters in, in Northern Ireland is really great to see so thanks ever so much for all the really hard work that, that you do to make that happen. Um, I just wanted to give maybe just a really kind of high level overview because you don't often get this, this opportunity and um, I suspect people are out there wondering what on earth has been going on in Siren, particularly in these uh, really interesting times. And uh, I guess the answer is probably much the same as, as you all experience in, in your businesses and, and line of work. It's, um, it has been challenging. Um, you know, the Siren team uh, that were based in London have been working remotely now for over 12 months. It was about, about this time last year that we uh, went off to our homes with our, our IT equipment and started to work remotely. And um, we are starting to plan for how we might return to physically being together in the office. Um, but, you know, there's not a massive driver for that, particularly because, you know, we've been very successful, I think, both in terms of IT, but also in terms of people's um, willingness and ability to adapt to this new way of working. And um, 
as far as I know, there has been no disruption to, to member services. Um, you know, branch group activities, events, learning and development, professional review, interviews, our technical panels, they've all continued to operate uh, digitally. We've made that digital transformation. Um, and so, you, you know, that's, that's really um, pleasing, I think, to be able to look back on. The last year has been financially challenging and also really challenging for the, the team as well, for, um, for our people, as I'm sure you would reflect in your own um, line of work. Um, we got through, though. Um, we've held back on some of the recruitment that we had plans to make. We made use of the furlough scheme. And we've also repurposed people in their roles temporarily to enable us to um, concentrate on slightly different things. So I think, you know, I, I trust and hope that outwardly the, the level of service we've been able to provide has, has not um, taken a turn for the worse. But I can assure you behind the scenes, it's been um, there's been a lot of adjustments we've had to make. Um, however. Despite all of that, our membership has actually grown uh, quite nicely over 2020 and continues to do so. And also what's particularly pleasing as well is that the number of people coming through to us for professional review interview for various charterships and other registrations um, has grown. And in 2020, we brought in, uh, we undertook uh, um, 237 professional review interviews during that, that 12 months. Um, so that's that's really pleasing to see. And of course, all done digitally. So even if we get back to um, a world where people will, will have a you know, physical interview, um, we have that capability now and, um, and it enables us to do things globally much more readily as well. Just to finish off on this little sort of just sort of look back slightly, um, I have to say that, that the branches around Sun have been absolutely tremendous. Um, you all, every branch has really got behind the digital transformation and sees the opportunities that it brings. Um, and boy, does it bring opportunities. If we just look at the um, this year, uh, year to date, um, our branches and groups have uh, or will have hosted 22 events delivering 27 hours of CPD um, by the end of, of March. And if you look at it in terms of attendance in January and February alone, there have been 2,122 people registered for our events. Now, if you think back to the times of, of meeting in, uh, in uh, a, a local premises, a village hall or whatever else it was that we would, uh, branches would meet in, um, that's unprecedented. And not only is it an impressive number, it's from uh, people that are located in uh, many countries around the world as well. So I think as branches going forward, we need to think about um, not just um, the geography that we sit in, but the ability to represent all the great things that are happening within that geography and represent them around the world. Um, to be a curator, if you like, and a sharer of best practice all around the world, that's I think the future role of or one of the future role of our branches. So that's the past. Just quickly looking ahead to uh, the current year, 2021. There's two significant things happening this year for SIWEM. The first one is that we have a corporate strategy um, which uh, lasts for, for five years and it's in its last year. And so we are just starting on the process of rewriting that strategy. And uh, that's been led by our trustee board with um, a team of supporters from uh, the executive. And we are, as part of that, that planning process, we, as you would hope and expect, um, are really wanting to seek the input and ideas and thoughts across our whole membership. So there will it will be a consultative process, and um, over the coming next uh, coming weeks, we'll start putting out some information about how you can engage with that strategy, um, which we want to set for the for the next five years, and with a little bit of look even beyond a five year horizon as best as we can. So that is really exciting, I think, 
Um, the last strategy that we set four years ago, I think, has served us well. Um, but of course, within that period, we as an organisation made a declaration of a climate and ecological emergency. And whereas I think the strategy, you know, accommodated that that well, that is a huge development that has happened since we set the original strategy. So I would expect that alone to be making a difference to our approach going forward. So that's the first thing. The second thing is our digital transformation as an organisation. We had plans to move into a more digital institution, um, probably going back a year and a half, two years ago. And we were starting to make some progress. Well, of course, the pandemic has actually been quite helpful in that regard because it has certainly accelerated that progress in some respects. Um, I think perhaps mainly because it was never really a technological, uh, an issue of technology. It was an issue of, of people being able to adapt their behaviours and, and approaches. And um, it, was a, it was a human thing that needed shifting, not so much a technological thing. So we are in a good position now to build on that. And we have set aside budget specifically this year to enable that transformation to, to start happening much more widely. So yes, it will, be, it will include improvements in our capability for webinars and the way we communicate around the world of course it will but it will be much wider and deeper than that um, and our aim really is to make um, services to members um, as uh, engaging and as slick and efficient as possible um, so that will be a component of it and also the ways that we can interact with with other stakeholders uh, around the world um, we'll be looking to, to make all sorts of improvements around that. So we currently have uh, an external advisor in place who's interviewing various parts of our organised people in various parts of our organisation uh, to work out a plan. And um, certainly by, I should say, sort of late spring, early summer, we'll be able to start sort of sharing how that is shaping up and how that, that might look. So I hope you're as excited about that as I am, because... You know, we may well be uh, 126 years old as an institution, but we are certainly not stuck in any points back in history. We are very much looking at the silent of the future and making sure we are contemporary. So I would leave it at that, um, Daniel. I mean, I am really happy to take questions through the Q&A or whatever uh, other media they can be thrown at me. And... And I think as well, Daniel, you wanted just to sort of go on and highlight a few things, didn't you, um, by way of events, et cetera? Yes, I can do. I'll quickly um, go through the events, keep uh, everyone on tender hooks for a few minutes. Um, but I suppose in terms of our upcoming events, our next one is a lunchtime presentation on the 31st of March. Um, this event will be given by none other than Mr. Warren Bowl from AME. The presentation will be on the second cycle of the Northern Ireland Flood Risk Management Plan 2021 to 2027. Um, so if you want to join us and hit Warren with a couple of tricky questions like he was throwing out this evening, uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, just very quickly on our social media, uh, all of our upcoming events are available on the SIWEM website uh, and all SIWEM Northern Ireland events um, are, are highlighted on our social media platforms. That is Twitter, that's SIWEM underscore NI, all caps, and uh, LinkedIn, that's SIWEM Northern Ireland branch. And as I may have mentioned in the past, uh, there is a SIWEM YouTube page and it's really, really good uh, and useful learning platform to catch up on past events and covering some really relative uh, topics, particularly those that are going for a chartership or going through the chartership process. There's some really, really good resources there. So it's definitely worth subscribing to. Um, and then just was an event or in terms of SIWEM's development and learning. Uh, SIWEM uh, will be running some uh, mentor e-learning modules during 2021. Uh, it's a practical one-day face-to-face course or it's 
get delivered over Zoom. And it's delivered by an expert in their field and focuses on the core skills and behaviors and techniques needed to be a mentor of the highest professional standard. Um, the first training day will be taken, held on the 26th of March, and that will be followed by the 25th of June and the 8th of October. So if you're interested in this one day course, you can do so by signing up on the SciWM website under the training tab and the costs are £375 plus fat. Uh, so before I close the event, I take it Warren has been nominated to be the judge to uh, award us. Who else? Who else could you pick? Exactly. <laughs> <you know? laughs> no. Um, no, well, as I said, just, it just goes the same. The guys have all done very well tonight. Um, they've all spoken well. The presentations have all been very clear. And, and to be perfectly honest, yes, they've answered some stinking questions. Um, <laughs> and that's great. And it's, it's good for them as well. So, um, but as in life, there can be only one winner. Um, and tonight's winner is Sarah McCord from ACOM. Um, so, so Sarah, Sarah wrote a fabulous paper. And, and as I said, I thought tonight her presentation was very clear and she spoke very well about it and she's obviously got good knowledge of, of her field. So congratulations, Sarah. Thank you very much. Um, and I think, I think Dan and Dan um, can now tell you about your prize. So the prize, the most important thing, uh, in addition to all the experience you've got preparing a technical paper and presenting it to peers, uh, there was a number of about 40 people on the call tonight. And that's probably the highest number that I can certainly remember. Um, so the prize is £250 and that will be delivered into your bank account, not by the end of the day. This isn't the cash call on uh, thing, but it will be sent over to you. But also, not only that, we appreciate that there is an awful lot of time goes into delivering a paper, preparing a paper and rewriting and writing and preparing your presentation and whatnot. And a lot of that is done in your own time. So to all of our finalists, um, there will be to the three runners up, if you like, a uh, 50 pound will be delivered into your uh, bank account by close of play whenever we get that sorted so we'll, um, we'll be in contact in the near future and we'll get that sort of sent out to you but just a note of thanks to you all because it is a very big um, it is a very big a lot of work goes into preparing these presentations as has been demonstrated on your papers and indeed by on your presentations and you know it is it's it's definitely worthwhile I, as I said previously I've taken part in this event myself in the past um, and I, I found just to learn an experience of you you know, presenting to be absolutely um, very, very worthwhile. So well done to you all. And just to note that there was a, a huge number of applicants this year as well. So to narrow it down to the final four was very, very difficult. So to make it to this stage was very, very good. Uh, and even this year, because we're recording everything uh, in the past, we were in Malone House or in the RPS offices before that. Uh, and normally there wasn't as, as, as big of an attendance as, as is worthy of it. But tonight there's been a big attendance. So there's a lot Lot of lot of things hanging on it so well done to you all and of course to sarah and um, the winner of this year's uh, new members papers competition so before i close uh, i'm going to wrap it up because it's still light outside i had to close the curtain because there was sun shining through my window but on behalf of the cyway northern ireland branch i'd like to give a big thank you to all our contestants judges and of course uh, our uh, branch secretary Louise McNamee for coordinating this event uh, a lot of work does go into this behind the scenes and I'd also like to give a big note of thanks to Terry Fuller for joining us for this event we know you're very very busy we're absolutely honoured to have you here tonight and of course to Barbara Woods and the TSIOM uh, team for coordinating this uh, event and, and, and all TSIOM events there's a lot going on you just have to look at the TSIOM website and what all the upcoming events so there's a lot of work going on in the background a lot of conferences and webinars and finally i'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening to support the event and continuing to support all of our cywm northern ireland events and the wider cywm community events